So the afternoon session is understanding, managing and communicating risk. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch and your workshops. I know I did the chart ship one and it was very informative. I hope you all had fun and worked together. I'd like to present our first speaker of the afternoon, which is Hazel Gibson. She's from the University of Plymouth. Uh, she's going to be discussing uh, how we can maybe improve communications between um, geoscience experts and non-experts. So Hazel, if you'd like to come up. Control is there if you want to go next. Thank you. Laser. So, hello everyone. Um, my name's Hazel Gibson. I'm from the Sustainable Earth Institute at the University of Plymouth. And my work is a little bit different to what you guys have been hearing about so far today. I think I work a lot with um, geoscience communication and how we can use the different ways that people think about geology to improve how we communicate about it. So probably more than maybe some other sectors of the geoscience community, the people in this room spend more time interacting with non-geologists about geology than, than I would say pretty much some of the other groups would ever do. Um, and so you have a really good understanding of some of the challenges that you can face when you're talking about this area below the surface um, when you're talking about that with anyone who's not a geologist. So particularly when we're talking about geoscience communication, we often say that it's to do with talking to the public or talking to people that you might meet when you're out about doing site surveys or something like that. But actually geoscience communication can include talking to anybody who's not a geologist, so any stakeholder group at all can encounter difficulties when you're talking with them about your current studies. A lot of the ways that we get around issues to do with geoscience communication, particularly with varied stakeholder groups, is by thinking about something called framing. Now, framing is something that everyone does pretty much automatically, where you look at an issue and you take a certain perspective on it based on your own experience. Now, this can also be done for other people. If you're looking at, say, a local residence group who's got significant concerns about a development that's happening near them, the frame for them is the fact that they live in this local area. So what's going to be important in information for them is what's locally relevant. And we also try and uh, avoid misconceptions by looking at careful use of language. Now, when we're thinking about how we're using language as geologists, this can be pretty tricky because quite a lot of our language might sound the same to a normal member of the public, but actually when you get down to what it means, it means something completely different. And so you can go into a conversation with someone and not realise that you're actually not making sense to them. So part of the problems that we've been finding when we're looking at people that are talking about geology and geoscience subjects to lots of different groups of people is that actually issues of using the right language and using the right frames, using what's important to people, doesn't actually go far enough in helping them to understand what's going on with geology when we're trying to make ourselves understood and have really effective conversations. And a lot of this problem comes down to something that's much more fundamental than just the way that we talk about geology, but actually the way that we think about geology. And that's really what we've been looking at down at Plymouth, is trying to find out how different groups of people think about geology and how that affects the way that they talk about it. So um, we recently conducted a study, and it was a very broad stroke study based down in Cornwall and Devon. And it was looking at how people in three different locations thought about their local geology. Now, we intentionally did it, not focusing on any one specific area, industry, or issue. <coughs> And we picked three different sites that had very different things going on there. So the first site that we chose was near Truro, down in Cornwall, and it has a lot of geological history, but not very much activity happening in terms of industry or commercialization. The second site we chose was just outside of Plymouth, which is the new Drakeland's tungsten mine has just opened there. So it's very industrial active, but doesn't have a lot of history. And then the third site we chose was a control site up in North Devon, which doesn't really have very much visible geology or very much kind of um, commercial geology either, shall we say, as a kind of control. And we wanted to help people um, express the ways that they were thinking about geology in the subsurface. What's underneath you right now? And people have a lot of problems with this if they're not geologists, because actually thinking like a geologist is pretty difficult if you haven't been trained how to do it. So we decided to use a cube model like this one to help people express their ideas. And so each village had their own cube model with a 3D representation of what was on the surface and the ability to draw what was underneath to help us explore these ideas that people had about geology. 
Now, as I say, this is a very broad stroke study, and so we were looking at big ideas in geology. But what's really interesting is how this can be applied in lots and lots of different fields, and that's hopefully what we're going to have a bit of a talk about today. So the first thing that you do in a study like this is you start with the experts. You ask the expert very first of all. So this was a cube model that was drawn by a local um, geoscience expert, and all the names have been anonymised, by the way. He's not actually called Eric. Um, <laughs> And he drew this brilliant model of the local area around the village that we were studying, because he worked and lived nearby there as well. And there are a few key things to note about this model, which I am pretty okay. sure if I gave all of you this same task, you would also do the same thing. One of the first things to note is that more than one side of the model is filled in. This expresses three-dimensional thinking. Geologists commonly think in 3D. It's something that's very easy for geologists to do, and you do it automatically. So this is not something that's difficult, and it's something that happens quite quickly. The second thing that you'll notice is that there's a lot of symbology, and actually, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but there's some technical language used as well on the cube. So you're using a separate type of language, a visual language as well, not just using words to describe what's happening, but this visual language. And the third thing that happened that was really important was I'm not sure if you can see, but on the top, there are a row of little squares, and this is the surface expression of a fault line. So actually, when Eric started drawing this cube model, he started at the surface. He looked for visual cues on the landscape and projected those down into the subsurface. Now, this was something that he did very commonly, and he did this whilst he was talking about it as well. For instance, one of the quotes that he said was, I think of it in terms of Devon and Cornwall, I think of a spine of outcrops of granite which are connected together below the surface. They're all the same bit of granite, just poking out of the ground at different places, having been intruded up through sediments and metamorphosized those sediments to a significant extent, creating a sort of local mishmash of metamorphosized rocks that people refer to as killers. Now, this was quite an intense description of the geology of the area, given quite shortly. But what you can see in the way that he's talking about this, he's bouncing about between what you can visually see in the landscape and therefore what exists underneath. Now, if you contrast this to the way that a local person who is not a geologist spoke about the granites particularly, something that people spoke about a lot, you get a very, very different feel. This was Holly, who lives in one of the little um, villages near the New Tungsten Mine in Devon. And she said, well, when you live here, I think the people around here are very proud of their granite. They love their granite. They love the tours. They love walking on Dartmoor and what have you. I think it's, it's very much an identity as well, because when you drive into different parts of the country, we always say drive about and you know you've come home when you see the granite. Now, this was a really commonly expressed idea. The fact that granite wasn't something geological, that it didn't exist as a clue to what was in the landscape, but it was something very important to people, and they held it as a part of their identity. This idea of connecting to something visual in the landscape, and it meaning that you come home, was really commonly expressed. And so when we started to see this kind of difference in the way that people were talking about the rocks and the way people were talking about the landscape, we started to wonder... <laughs> How are non-geologists bridging that divide? If a geologist is commonly and happily bouncing about between the surface and the subsurface in the way that they talk about the geology, what's happening with the non-geologist? And what we found was really interesting. We found that non-geologists tend to use one of two distinct ways to move between the surface and the subsurface when they're thinking about geology. The first one is one that's fairly familiar when you start looking at it, but has some interesting little quirks later. And we call this the geoscience-centric model. Now, this is kind of logical for a geologist. If you're looking at it, you see there's lots of layers. Um, there's some grass at the top there. Uh, we have the core here. Um, and what was really interesting about this is that there was no scales given to anybody. They had to put their own scales on the models. Um, each cube was approximately three kilometers by three kilometers square on the top visually in the landscape, so to think that the core exists that shallow beneath the surface is a little concerning. But um, there's also a lot of detail added into this person's model. Interestingly, though, if I remind you, this person is someone who lives in Cornwall. So they've identified the layers exist in the earth as older than the Cambrian, the Cambrian, the Devonian, these two are lumped together as the pre-dinosaur era, You've got the dinosaur eras, which have been dated, and then you've got human influences, which is basically one, two, three, maybe and a bit more layers above that. 
And these are divided into historical eras. Now, the other thing that I think is really, really fascinating with this diagram is actually the grass drawn at the top. Because what that tells me is that this person didn't connect what they were thinking about in the subsurface with what they could see in the landscape at all. This is just a drawing board for them. There is no link between what's happening in the landscape and what's happening underneath. And that's kind of logical, because if you think in Cornwall, what's happening underneath is not all of these things. It's the slates and the sandstones and the shales. It's the granites. It's these big intrusive bodies of the batholith coming through. It doesn't look like this. This is a very, very generic model of geology that this person has depicted, and it could apply anywhere. It's not locally relevant at all. But it's not necessarily wrong. There's a lot that's familiar about it. When we're talking about how we share information about geology, we use this kind of structured, layered format quite a lot. So what's the other method then? If this kind of familiar but not locally specific at all method is one of the two types of ways, the other type of way we called the anthropocentric way that people penetrate into the subsurface. Now, this was exemplified by um, Cara's diagram of a mine. Now, Cara also lived in Cornwall, and she drew this mine in extreme detail. There was lots of information. She had a family history of mining, and so she was able to draw a lot of information back about um, what features you might see in the mine. What was really interesting was that after a long conversation about this, and the mine was connected to the surface, where there is actually a mine stope at the surface, she identified that in the landscape, but when I asked her what was around the mine, she said it was dark, which is really interesting, because what that shows you is that she can't go beyond the mine in the way that she's thinking about the geology. Maybe can't, maybe won't, I'm not sure which one it would be, but certainly if you were talking to Kara about what was underneath her, this is be what she's thinking about. She wouldn't be thinking about the rocks, she wouldn't be thinking about the movement of water or anything like that. So this was a very common other way of people getting into the subsurface. And what was really interesting as well about the anthropocentric method was that it wasn't always logical in a way that you would expect it to be logical. Hillary, another one of my favourite quotes, came out and said, I guess there might be some clay around here as there's a clay mine, but I couldn't say for sure. <laughs> now, this seems completely illogical, doesn't it? You think there's a clay mine, therefore there must be clay. But this is not surprising. This was actually quite a common thought. And so this idea that people hang their concepts of geology on physical things they can see in the landscape, particularly human interactions with that landscape, but then don't take it any further is really important to us. So what can we do about this? How can we kind of get around this problem? Well, one of the other things that we see a lot with this kind of um, study is the way that people take things that happen on the surface and project them into the subsurface. This is most commonly done with the movement of water, which is something that I'm sure that a lot of you have a lot to do with. But uh, Christian gave a brilliant example of this by saying, I think if I was asking him what was underneath and he was talking about water, and he says, I think you'd find a lot of water, there'd be lots of channels, because the water would seep into the ground and there'd be an underground network of holes or natural sewers. Now, what's really my favourite part of this is actually his second quote here, because he was saying, because of the volume of water we have and we don't flood as much, there must be some kind of water table that bits of land are kind of not floating on top of, but almost resting on top of. Now, to give you an idea what this looks like, this is the diagram that he drew. Now, when you think about the land is floating on top of the water, that's the water. And there's a river here, and this is what's <coughs> under the river, is more water, and then everything else is floating on top of it. Now, this is an expression of surface processes projected into the subsurface. Christian is familiar with water, he's familiar with rivers and lakes, and therefore the way that it works on the top must be the way that it works underneath. And this was so common, particularly with water, it's a really, really common idea. In fact, we went back and we re-questioned a lot of our subjects to try and get more people to get a better idea of how common these ideas were. And one of the questions that we asked people is, how much do you agree with the statement, water naturally forms channels underground in order to uh, flow through the rock? This was the only option they were given, only forms channels underground. 78.9% said yes. 
It's the only way that it can move. And what's really interesting about that is you think, well, that's clearly wrong. That's not the only way that it can move. And in fact, quite often we're dealing with much different processes. But if this is the way that people are hanging their ideas when they're talking to you about geology in the subsurface, then there's a big thing that we have to overcome here. Now, this um, thing that we are... Oh, this thing that we overcome, oh, too fast. We use um, ideas that help us to make links to our public. So this is the final model that we came up with from our study. It's incredibly intense. Don't worry about it. You don't need to read everything. But the basic idea that you need to think about is we divided up the concepts that people were thinking about when they thought about geology into what was above ground and what was below ground generally. And then we mapped the two different groups, the experts and the non-experts, to see where the matches were. And this is what we found. Everywhere that it is, uh, the, the node, the circular node is coloured in, uh, or rectangular, is coloured in red, is where there's a mismatch between the expert and the non-expert. Everywhere it was vague or didn't quite match or that was unformed is yellow, and everywhere there was a match is green. Now, the key thing that you should note from this diagram is Concepts above the surface have a very strong match between the two groups. Concepts below the surface do not. This is where the problem is happening. It's this jump between the two places. But we do have an area in common. We share concepts around the space above ground. So we have this common ground existing already. Now, what this means is that things that might seem really logical to us, such as if you see slate at the top of a hill, it means that the hill might be made of slate, is not necessarily what your audience are thinking. If they see something in the landscape that is a cue to what exists beneath, that's a cue for you, but not necessarily a cue for them. And this needs to be made much more explicitly referenced whenever you're doing some kind of communication. Um, and this was, again, a question we asked. We were looking at how people connect surface landscape cues with what existed underneath and the links were not strong and they didn't match with the experts at all so it was a really interesting idea that when we're talking about these two different distinct places they're not different and distinct for us but they are for people that are not geological experts now one last thing i want to throw in here is a word that i know you guys have been talking about a lot today which is uncertainty but i'm talking about a very different kind of uncertainty um, when you talk about uncertainty, particularly with members of the public, what they tend to do think is, I don't know. That's where uncertainty goes with them. It's not a measure, it's not a statistic, you can't categorise it, it just means you don't know. And this problem of being uncertain in the subsurface was something that a lot of people shared. When we were talking about geology and geological subjects, um, this kind of model, where this was the entire model out of 20 minutes of conversation, which was, what exists beneath you? Well, there's a layer of soil, there's a layer of rock, there's some water in there somewhere, and there's a couple of other maybe layers, I don't really know. And Christopher summed it up by saying, I really wouldn't have a clue. I'd say at the top layer you have some soil, I'd call it, probably another layer of some sort of rock, and that's about as far as I can go. And this is very, very common. The problem with this kind of issue, with this idea of... Um, non-expert uncertainty is that it means they have to start their idea somewhere they can't start it in the subsurface because they've got nothing to hang that idea on they have no frame from which to start under the ground and so what this really means is that when we're talking about geology in the subsurface and we're talking to people that aren't geologists it's really important to remember, remember that we have very fundamental differences in the way that we think about what's going on down there not just the way that we talk about it and the context that we place it in but actually the way that we're thinking about how it exists and experts commonly use landscape cues when they're thinking about geology and you're able to connect with what you can see visually in the landscape to what exists in the subsurface. But this is not commonly done, at least at first, with non-experts. This is not to say that they can't do that. Absolutely can and quite often will. It's just not the first place that they start. When they start thinking about a geological concept, they use certain cues to get them into the subsurface, and they tend to be either this anthropomorphic model, using human activity to get them in the subsurface, but there's not really much around the human activity, or they use a really generic geoscience-centric model, 
which helps them understand the geology but has no local relevance whatsoever. So when you're talking about something that's locally specific, if they're using a massively generalised model to understand what you're talking about, there's going to be a lot of disconnect there. And this has a lot of implications for us as geology communicators um, in that we need to start our communications in a really familiar place. So particularly that shared area of the surface, if we're starting our communications with what we visually see in the landscape and then explicitly draw those pathways down, then you're going to have a lot better chance at taking the people with you that you're having these conversations about into that underground world that they might be less familiar with than us. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Hazel. That was a very interesting talk and a good uh, yeah, investigation, seeing how people interpret it. So, yeah, I think I uh, underestimated or overestimated how much they knew. Uh, so, next, I'd like to welcome Matthew Pierce, who's from National Grid. Matthew's going to give a talk about an interesting uh, spreadsheet they use to prioritise their sites. So, Matthew, can you like to come up? Okay. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon everyone. Um, so as it says, I'm Matthew Pearce. I'm the Operations Programme Manager at National Grid Property, which broadly speaking means my team is responsible for um, commissioning our supply chain to do all the various projects we do, whether that be a contaminated land project, gas holder, demolition, those kind of things. Um, so I'm going to give a bit of an introduction to, to who we are and a bit about our portfolio and talk a bit about how we manage it, including um, how we how we um, identify our different risks and how we prioritise our risks, um, and then really move on to some of the challenges we see um, for our portfolio. Um, so, starting off with who National Grid are. So, most of you probably know, National Grid are a um, gas and electricity transmission business, primarily in the UK. We also do a few other little bits, like um, LNG importation at the Isle of Grain. Um, we have various interconnectors we're putting in place um, with Ireland and the continent. Um, something not a lot of people know is half our business is over in the US. Um, in the um, northeast USA, we, we have a big utility business there as well. Um, and until recently, we had a well, four of the UK gas distribution regions, um, but we, we sold them last year, so which I'll touch on later. Um, in terms of national grid property, so we're a very small part of a much larger utility company. And there's kind of two parts to what we do. There is the um, surplus sites, which we own as a non-regulated business, and our job with those is to take these kind of difficult, risky sites, get them to a position where we can sell them out of the business and, and um, get them back into beneficial use. We also have a sort of almost a consultancy role to the rest of our business, the regulated part of the business. So if there is a, um, I suppose a contaminated land issue um, elsewhere in the business, we, we sort of support them and um, help to manage that risk. Um, and for those of... Uh, I was about to ask, does anybody know where um, this is? But it does actually say on the slide, so that's, that's not a terribly tricky question. But, but this is Beckton. Um, this is one of our larger sites in London, which is a... Um, I'm led to believe was the largest manufacturing gas plant um, in Europe in its time, um, which is a site we still own lots of, and you know, some of these sites still have some really interesting challenges. Okay, and uh, these are some beautiful pictures of our sites. Um, so our portfolio is very varied. Um, I should have said our, our surplus portfolio has a little over 300 sites in it now. Um, and they have a lot of differences amongst them, and they range from the really, really small, you know, smaller than your living room kind of thing, through to, to very, very large sites, as, as you saw with Beckton, which we still own the majority of that. Um, they vary a lot in value, from the um, virtually valueless, and in fact extremely negative value, um, up to the a, a much smaller number, sadly, of sites which have a, have a larger value. Um, but there are quite a lot of com commonalities between them. So. Clearly, uh, they're not all quite as tarry as that, but we do. most of our sites are former gas works. We do have a legacy um, of, of gas works contamination, which, which is a lot of our job is dealing with that. Uh, we have a lot of redundant assets. We have around 130 um, unused gas holders on our sites, um, and that's a little bit of a difficult picture to get your head around. Uh, that is someone base jump, jumping off one of our gas holders. Uh, they were kind enough to send a picture into a tabloid newspaper, uh, who, won't, who I won't uh, reference, but... Um, uh, we, we have, you know, we, these are a, um, an asset which gives us a few headaches in terms of liability and risk, and, and we have a programme of bringing them down. Another function of our sites is 
Um, even when we don't have a redundant asset on our site, we normally have live um, gas assets next to our sites as a sort of function of our, our shared history with the gas industry. Um, so very often we have gas pipes crossing under or indeed over our land going to um, our neighbours who might be um, SGN, NGN, Cadent, um, Wales and the West. Um, so we, so that, that's a big stakeholder for us. Um, we have a lot of people will recognise this as a bat hotel. Um, we have a lot of um, uh, interesting uh, buildings on our site, not always in, in the best condition, and we have the normal ecological issues you'd kind of expect, including everybody's friend, Japanese knotweed. Um, so this is kind of how we manage our portfolio kind of in a slide, and a point which will come out as I go through these points is around consistency, because managing in a consistent kind of in a consistent way, considering risk as you go through is, is so critical when you've got a large portfolio of sites. So, um, starting um, with, we can't do everything at once. You couldn't possibly clean up all the sites, get them all into a position where you could sell them quickly. Um, so, we have to manage some of our sites, and where we can, we'll do that by leasing out. The decision whether you can lease a site out is obviously based on, on risk, which, again, we have to have a consistent approach to. Um, some of our sites um, we can't put tenants on and we have to manage the security issues and, and the uh, sort of compliance estate issues which go along with, um, with having, having, I suppose I, I don't like to use the word, but sort of derelict sites um, and, we, and we have all the problems you'd expect of trespass and, and travellers and that kind of thing. And actually one of the things we've done in recent time is to start using these very clever, clever gadgets on our sites which um, is essentially a pin code padlock um, but we control who gets their own pin code and when it's active which means we can control the risk of the people going onto these sites because we can ensure before you get the code, you get the information about what the hazards on that site are. Um, they're also rather clever in that they give us a phone call when travellers are breaking onto our sites so we can, we can send the police out um, a bit quicker. Um, so, um, obviously we know on many of these sites we're going to have to do some remediation, so um, we hold a financial provision. Again, consistency is really important in this because it's a financial provision and hence it gets audited by those lovely accounting people every year. We need to be able to demonstrate that we've, um, we, we've done that in a consistent way. Um, and, we, and we have a, have a system, our best estimate reporting spreadsheet, which captures all that information from our consultants so we can, we can demonstrate that consistency. Um, probably the most important piece of consistency is around risk. And um, all parts of our policy re refer back to a system we call PORT, which is our prioritisation or risk tool. Um, and that is essentially a great big spreadsheet which our consultants fill in, which is a source pathway receptor model. And for each of the linkages, there's a consequence likelihood um, assessment which gives you a PORT score in there. And depending on the PORT score, um, that feeds into all our decisions. So whether we can lease a site, when we're going to remediate a site, and indeed where, whether we can sell a site and in what circumstances we can sell a site. So um, that's absolutely key to our decision making and also important in how we explain to our stakeholders what we're going to do. So for example, we might have a particular local authority or an environment agency in a particular part of the country saying, you know, we're, we're worried about this site. And we, we can use this to explain, yeah, we're worried about it too, but actually we've got these ones over here which are, which are higher in our, our, our to-do list for these reasons. Um, obviously, um, we then have to remediate sites um, and, in many cases, dim dismantle gas holders. So, um, again, consistency comes into it at the risk of repeating myself. So, we, there's a couple of reasons we need to be consistent. We want to be consistent in terms of our uh, stakeholders understanding what we're going to do. If we, we could do 10 projects really well and then do uh, the next one in a way which upsets the neighbours and, and, and that's very damaging to our reputation. Um, so being consistent for our stakeholders and also being consistent um, has a lot of advantage just, just from a logistical point of view. If, you, um, if you're set at, you know, we, we sort of doing 50 odd remediation projects a year and um, in the order of, well, we're moving up to sort of 30 odd gas holder um, demolitions a year, you can't be reinventing the wheel every time. You have to have specifications and procedures and that leads you to a degree of consistency. Um, we then, um, on some of our sites, we're then looking to relocate gas equipment. So that's not something we're doing ourselves. That's something we have to work with um, other parties to do. So that's an important piece from a stakeholder management point of view. And then ultimately, we need to dispose of sites and sell sites. So here you've got the consistency piece around, um, around risk. So selling sites which have met a, a, a certain level, a certain risk profile. And for us, we have a... Um, 
we, we, we attempt to address statutory risks um, for an open storage scenario, which I won't go into in too much detail now. Um, and there's also a consistency piece around how we sell sites. So when you're selling you know, 50, 60 sites a year, you can't be negotiating details of the contract every single time. So we have a fairly sort of robust, uh, this, these are our T's and C's, and you buy it or you don't, and generally people do. Um, so, um, so moving on to a few of the challenges we face with a portfolio of land, and it's probably fair to say a lot of these challenges are challenges <coughs> if you had one or two sites, um, but some of the issues are accentuated um, with when you're looking at a portfolio. And I've, I've ordered these a little bit into ones which we sort of have a bit more control, a bit more predictable, um, and generally we worry about a little bit less. And as I, as I go through, I'll move on to ones where we either have a bit less control a bit less predictable and, and generally keep us up a little bit more at night. Um, so I'll start with um, legacy liability and um, contaminant profile. So um, I'll go through these fairly quickly. So in terms of legacy liability, obviously when selling contaminated land, um, you very much want to avoid that liability bouncing back either through part two A or through the courts. Um, and um, that problem or that, or that risk gets accentuated when you're selling many, many sites. Um, and obviously it's got a significant time delay to it. So we don't want to be in a position where in 20 years time there's no sites left in the business, but there's lots of liabilities bouncing back for the business to deal with. And that leads to a fairly, fairly risk averse approach, I would suggest. Um, so at the core of it, we have um, remediation. So the fact we remediate most of our sites to a certain level before we sell them massively reduces that legacy liability risk. We have the contracts I referred to, which are fairly um, boilerplate from a um, sort of seller's um, point of view. Um, so acknowledgements, indemnities, which people don't like, but they generally sign up to. We then have obviously all the protections through part two A and the planning regime. And on where we're selling a site with a high, slightly higher um, risk um, uh, associated with it, we have the additional um, thing we can add, which is post-completion obligations, which broadly speaking means we're putting something on the title which says you can't use this site for anything until you've gone through planning, um, would, be, would be what that would typically say, which gives us that extra layer of protection of ensuring it goes through, through the planning system and we get a protection of the MPPF before, um, before that site is used for something else and generally reduces the risk that someone will buy it for a development and then just start using it for something else and then that liability bounces back to us. Okay. Um, in terms of contaminant profile, so this is something which doesn't worry us too much. You know, there's a lot of gas works around, and people, people generally understand um, the contaminant profile pretty well. Um, we know <coughs> benzopyrene, which everyone hopefully will recognise, which is um, our risk driver on, from a human health point of view on most of our sites. Um, we have some things which we, we need to think about a bit harder, so we know um, vapour um, risk modelling is, is pretty conservative, and, and we reasonably regularly get a sort of theoretical risk um, associated with, with vapours, um, which we then do a whole load more work and, and demonstrate isn't really there. I'm not sure we've ever had a, a true vapour risk from one of our sites. And so that worries us enough to be doing a bit more research on that and trying to, um, trying to improve those models. But ultimately, it, it very rarely is the cause of us remediating a site. It's more, more of an annoyance, I suppose, in terms of um, our, 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 our understanding of our um, profile. Um, and the other one, of course, is asbestos, which um, is probably asbestos in soil, I should say, which it's fair to say has been on a bit of a roller coaster over the last few years. Um, so um, probably about three years ago, everyone was a little, little bit panicked and uh, guidance obviously had come out, which, which was slightly unhelpful. And then there's been a lot of work within the industry to get us back to a place where we're far more comfortable and um, not something which worries us too much. Okay. Um, on to... Um, Another couple of points which worry us slightly more. Um, so doing the work we do in an efficient and sustainable way, and I'm, I'm going to concentrate in this presentation more on the sustainability part of that, and also um, regulatory engagement and regulatory framework. So in terms of sustainability, so um, obviously, uh, like most people, we want to do things in a sustainable way as we can and try to incorporate it into everything we do. And um, you probably hear that from lots of people. Um, having a portfolio of sites sometimes gives you some really exciting opportunities to do things in a more sustainable way. Um, so those pictures up the top left there, that is part of a tunnel boring machine being lifted down a shaft um, for the London Power Tunnels project. So um, probably not many of you are aware of this, but National Grid Electricity Transmission has been putting a whole load more uh, cables underground to kind of reinforce the grid in London. 
um, that gave us lots of lovely London clay, and we were able to work with that part of the business uh, to use about 175,000 cubes on that on some really local projects. So. Um, remediation projects we were doing in central London, gas holders we needed to infill in central London. So that was a really great sustainability gain and, of course, saved some money, um, which is always good. Uh, this stuff over here relates to a site um, in uh, Wales, Abu Dhabi. Um, so sometimes as a portfolio, the balance of um, whether you could, whether you can... Um, put a bit more weighting on the kind of social and environmental switches a bit when you consider a reputational point. So this was a site which it wasn't a particularly high value site, but it was a site which as part of our remediation, we were able to do some uh, sort of enhancement of the natural environment, plant some trees. We put some benches in, put some lovely signs in, um, in English and Welsh, of course, otherwise they would have been taken down very quickly. Um, and, and we were able to pass that site across to the local community. So, and we've got a couple more of those which are in process at the moment, which is really, really nice to see. The, um, the big challenge for us at the moment uh, is gas holder voids. So we have about 80, 90 of these beauties. Uh, you know, they're up to about 13 metres deep, up to about 60 metres diameter. So big holes to fill. Um, and we're trying to find, well, firstly, more sustainable ways of filling them. So filling them with lower grades of material, um, filling them from more local sources. And when you, when you look at sort of overall sustainability burden, it, so much of it is about road transport. Um, so we're looking at ways to infill them better. The other thing we've done is uh, we've run a competition through REBA, which is a Royal Institution of British Architects, to kind of get that community to start thinking, how could we actually use these as holes in the ground? Um, so we actually just shortlisted last week, um, and the finalists will come out in about a month's time. Um, you can see there's a, up there you've got a sort of residential scheme with kind of, it's quite hard to see, there's a sort of four-storey townhouses going down into a central courtyard within the gas holder. Uh, we've got another residential one using gas holders as a, essentially a water feature. Um, anyone who has a guess what that is? Sorry? No, it, it, it's a garden of remembrance. There's various places to intern uh, various bits of people in there. And in, interestingly, about 10% of the entries were along that theme. Um, just slightly inexplicable. Uh, this is battery storage, uh, battery storage below ground, um, car recharging above ground, and obviously that's a sort of leisure complex. So, um, we're, we're, you know, all, all of these are challenging to achieve, but we're really hopeful that we can, we can reduce the number of holders we're infilling and, and, and do some really exciting stuff like that. Okay, moving on uh, to regulator engagement. Um, so obviously um, our engagement with our regulators is key. Getting sign off on, on the work we're doing is important in terms of um, getting the value out of sites. Um, so we do site specific risk assessments and I think, I think it's fair to say when we're doing site specific risk assessments we, um, we get uh, good engagement from, from the regulators. Um, it's, there's probably a few risk assessors in, in here who wince at this, but it's, it's reasonably standard now in terms of detailed quantitative risk assessment. And when we're saying it's regulated, it generally is understood and it's fairly straightforward. Cost benefit analysis probably, to my mind, is maybe five, six years behind where risk assessment is in, case, in terms of understanding um, and acceptance within the regulator community. So that's something you know, we're trying to, trying to work with regulators to, to explain what we're doing. Um, but generally, we have slightly longer conversations when those go in. Um, so, um, obviously, getting regulatory closure is important to us. We do that um, through the planning process. That works very well. Um, on sites where we're not going through the planning process, uh, three years ago, we probably would have approached regulators and said, you know, could you, we've done this, we don't think we need to do any more, or we think we need to do this, and we would have got more engagement, um, probably, well, not through any fault of any regulator, um, just the terms of resources, we're finding that engagement harder to get now, um, which is hopefully something the National Quality Mark Scheme will, will look to address. I mean, and in terms of how we try and do that engagement with regulators, we try and do it early in the process, um, so where we're going to be working in an area, we, we have uh, sort of clogs events, training events, where we will sit down with our regulators, explain who we are, explain what we're doing, um, and kind of get their input and, and give a bit of training while we're at it. So, moving on to the things which um, arguably we have less control um, over, um, less predictable. Um, so, um, health and safety management, which, which I'll come on to, the control piece on that, and then stakeholder um, consultation and management, and within that third 
some of our most important stakeholders are those who have third party interests in our land, so services crossing our land or, or joint contamination problems with us. So um, health and safety management, so um, probably won't surprise you to hear National Grid has quite a strong safety culture when you've got people playing around with silly voltages and silly pressures of gas. Um, and arguably as a client, we have quite a lot of control over safety. So we, we choose our supply chain and we, we, you know, we can put a very high um, bar in terms of safety. We, we, we audit our supply chain far more than they would like us to. Um, and, we, and we can set standards to a certain degree without wanting to become a designer and take that responsibility away from our supply chain. But there are still lots of things which I'm not going to go through in any great detail there, which, which our supply chain do, which are inherently hazardous. Um, and from a, um, the fact we've got a portfolio, I think, helps us to a great degree because we're able to collect quite a lot of data. And again, people will say National Grid collects more data than they need to, but actually we're able to use a lot of that data. And if you think of sort of bird's triangle with your um, low-level stuff at the bottom and your, well, right at the top, your fatalities, we collect a lot of data at the lower, lower end and we're able to use that to focus our efforts um, to manage our safety. So, so a few years ago, we were having lots of kind of um, unsafe behaviours reported in terms of hands. You know, there were people not wearing gloves. We had a few sort of minor, minor cuts and things to hands. And we thought, hang on a minute, this is, this is something where, where we think, um, you know, there could be something more major underway. And we had a bit of a campaign supported by our supply chain. And, and you know, so far, um, that seems to have worked. And, and we, we've had less instance and less, less um, reports of people not wearing their gloves. So, on to stakeholders. So, um, stakeholders, obviously, uh, maybe not obviously, they, they, are, they are the thing which worries us the most. They're, they're, they're critical to everything we do. Um, and they worry us for lots of reasons. So, the first reason is, and I'm not going to go through all of these, we have an awful lot of them. Um, so, I sat, sat down with um, one of my colleagues, and we went through one particular job to try and work out how many stakeholders did we have. It was a gas holder demolition job, and um, we added up everyone we'd had any kind of communication with, and it was a little over 2,000 individuals. Um, now, a lot of those will have just got a letter from us saying, we're demolishing a gas holder, uh, it's going to smell a bit. Um, but, um, but actually, when we sort of started to look at the number, we actually either had an individual communication with, so a letter had gone to, an to a named person, or we, we'd actually heard the voice of us or one of our supply chain. It was around 300 people. And obviously, some of them are more critical to the delivery of a project than others, but actually probably any one of them could... Um, cause us a lot of problems if we, if we don't take them on the journey. And, and we have had examples where, you know, one individual resident who hasn't uh, quite accepted the work we're going to be doing in their neighbourhood has caused us huge delays and um, huge costs, so, and, and indeed huge reputational damage. So getting all those stakeholders on board early is, is really important to us. Um, obviously, they will all have slightly different agendas, and very often... Some of our biggest problems with bringing these sites forward come not necessarily different agendas, but different timescales of agendas. So, you know, um, for example, if we want a bit of equipment moved by a utility company, uh, they're quite happy to do it, they get paid for it, but maybe not in the timescales we're, we're hoping for to bring these sites forward. Um, so, and obviously, with a portfolio of sites, you've also got a reputational point. So... Um, the work we do on one site can have knock-on effects for us um, in that part of the world or, or if we get you know, national press coverage across the UK or if with some of our stakeholders it's a fairly small community so if we're working in a way which, which upsets them that, that can have significant um, disadvantages for us. Um, this is just a few pictures of um, how, we, how we manage um, our stakeholders so we, we, we work to make sure the people on site understand how to, um, how to engage with stakeholders get regulators, to, I'm not actually sure if that is a picture of regulators, but let's pretend it is, uh, to site early. Uh, we go into uh, local schools um, uh, to, and, and we, we do that to give the messages around, you know, w you know, this is an active site, please don't come and play on it, please watch out for lorries going down the road. And then we combine that with the kind of uh, the STEM agenda, which so we take robots in and so that's science, technology, maths, engineering, engineering, maths. Um, and every now and again, we get a nice letter. Um, although I should say, I'm sure I've seen that in presentations for years, so maybe we don't get that many of them. Uh, but, but we try to. Um, so a few final thoughts. Um, you know, these are difficult sites. We have a different portfolio. It's not easy. Um, consistency of approaches is, is, is critical. Um, if we, we need to make the right decisions for the right reasons in a consistent way, 
and we need um, we need to be able to explain to our stakeholders why we're making those decisions, so so they go so they understand um, what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, biggest challenges, predictably, stakeholder management, engagement, and health and safety. And that is it for me. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Matthew. Hazel, would you mind coming up for a sec? And uh, it's now time to ask either Matthew or Hazel any questions. Yes? Thanks. I'm curious as to whether there was a difference in the education levels of people who were Yeah. Um, we only spoke to adults, particularly, was one of the things that we were looking at because when it comes to geoscience communication, there's actually been a lot of study done on the way that children learn, particularly in classroom environments. And so we were looking at um, exclusively adults, which meant that, unfortunately, our sample sizes were very small. It's a common problem with any kind of social research. Um, because of that, there was a huge variety in people's educational backgrounds. What was interesting <coughs> was that um, that almost didn't seem to matter, but I would hesitate to say that certainly because of the amount of data that we had. But certainly the indication for the data is particularly once you've gone a good five years past your formal education, it kind of is less important that there are other factors that you're drawing on to learn about what's happening than your formalized education level. And that can be any level, which was really interesting. So, Yes, over there. Yes. Um, this, is, this was very interesting. So, again, another common problem with how you assess um, how much someone knows about a subject is this, this thing you often hear about is scientific literacy. I don't know if anyone's heard of scientific literacy. I hate scientific literacy because um, it measures how much you're able to talk about something by the facts that you know. And the measurements that we have, the measure scales, are appalling. Because if you write a question in a language that is accessible for a non-scientist, a scientist will have a problem being able to answer the question because it's not accurate enough. So, for example, the questions that we had about, you know, if you see slate sticking out the top of a hill, that means the hill is made of slate. The geologists were going, well, not necessarily. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of inherent variability, and we're like, just go with the obvious answer. <laughs> so, yes, but uh, it was pretty difficult. Doesn't that suggest your question might be ambiguous? Yes. And that, and that is a continuing problem. So, yeah, we have, we're, we're continuing to test the, the... This was only really the first survey that we've done of this, and these ideas that are coming out are now going to be subject to a whole series of further tests. And it may turn out to be not the way that we think it is right now. Um, these are just surprising, the, the kind of divisions that we've seen so far. But we'll be interested to see, and as well, how much the impact of education and culture influences it too, because we're in Devon and Cornwall. So Devon and Cornwall has such a strong historical cultural relationship with commercial geology that we're wondering how much that has influenced the way that people answered our questions. So, yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see it if you go to the north of all the coal mining, what, what their interpretations well, of it. The southeast is particularly where we'd be interested, where people yeah. don't have that strong link yeah. to landscape and geology as much as they do in some of the places where where it's more visible or where they have this historical family connection. connection to it, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, oh, yes, Leon. Yeah, um, just kind of a thinking around there, so sort of bringing in, we're talking earlier in respect to our models about scale. Um, I think I have you showed those lovely 3D block diagrams. Um, how will it be interesting for, say, in the, in the fracking debate, ask people to draw what they understand it means and then show them actually mm -hmm. a scale block diagram. Look how big that is. Yeah. And really understand whether people realise that they don't. Yeah. Scale is one of the biggest problems that we've been having because there's been a, a number of researchers looking at how people visualise scale in all kinds of environmental discussions, climate change, all kinds of things like that. And one of the consistent findings has been that if you put a numerical value for scale on your diagram, it doesn't matter if the relative sizes of objects doesn't work. 
So if you have a derrick and then a, a drill, like hydraulic fracturing underneath it, and the equivalent size of a flower is 30 foot tall, like in relationship, it doesn't matter if you say that that drill is three kilometers down, it's irrelevant to most people. You can have no numerical scale on a diagram, but if the relationship between the sizes of the objects is correct, it will help people understand a lot better. And this seems to be, be consistently true against a lot of different um, kind of areas. The problem with that then becomes, and this is really, it, I find it fun, but um, when you look at diagrams that people make to talk about things like fracking in particular, oh, they're awful. They're just, I mean, everyone's seen them. You know, the one with the truck and then the derrick is the same size as the truck and then the house and then the drill is just underneath it. And you're going, well, obviously people are worried about this is happening directly under my house mm -hmm. because the relationship scales are just really off. Even if there's a numerical scale, it doesn't, it doesn't help. But the way that people conceptualize scale seems to be, at the moment, hung completely around relationships rather than about numerical, which is, again, another difference between scientists and non-scientists, just generally. Yeah. Brilliant. Yes. Yeah, so it's another question for Hazel. So <laughs> Sorry. <wondering. laughs> right. I, gave you a I thought I was going to get any. <laughs> I wondered if you or your department um, had any dealings with radioactive waste management, RWM, because they're the organisation that's going to be, well, be doing a consultation fairly shortly to try to get communities to volunteer for a geological yeah. So that's all about people's perceptions and communication and things. Yeah. Um, I have had a couple of brief conversations with a couple of people from RWM about this. Obviously, they're very interested in how to make sure that the conversations that they're having with these communities are actually getting to the heart of the, the problems, if anyone has any issues, particularly the issues around water and the groundwater movement, I think, is the one that they, they've really been focusing on. Um, because this is something that seems... And it's one of these conversations I have quite often when you say, oh, you know, you're talking about groundwater with anyone who's not a geologist or a hydrogeologist, and they mention rivers underground. And everyone goes, yeah, I've totally had that conversation. So there's a lot of empirical... Uh, a lot of anecdotal evidence for this is how people think about water in the subsurface, but there doesn't seem to be much empirical evidence for it so far. And that's really what we're hoping to develop, is this kind of baseline for... If you're starting a conversation with someone about a contested or controversial, or even less contested and controversial, but just something that's really locally important to people, um, the best way to engage them in that conversation is to think about where they're starting from conceptually. And maybe this is about addressing ideas of rivers underground and things like that. It's very common. I mean, it, all science is having this issue right now with, of how to change the way that we talk to non-scientists. And, and, and I hesitate to say non-scientists as well because, like, for a geologist, nanotechnology is as much a non-science issue for some geologists. Not, not judging anybody. But um, <laughs> it can be as much of a non... You know, it's about not being in your specialism. It makes you as much of a non-scientist as anybody else. And all of science is having this issue of how do you not just tell people things and expect them to understand and agree with you, because that just doesn't work. And it's about making a space where you can have a conversation and accept that there are going to be issues that they, the people that are not in their specialism, are going to bring up. And you might think they're silly, but that they actually represent really important problems that they're having. They just don't know how to tell you. And that's really what we're trying to do, is develop this way to create a space for, for any professional environment to say, well, come and talk to us and we're going to meet you on your level. And it is, it's, not just, it's not just RWM. It's like every, every big institution is currently dealing with this right now. I mean, I think that's something that you were talking about with engaging with your stakeholder groups as well. You have to use so many different ways. Yeah, we're very careful in how we present things and to use non-technical language. And, yeah. 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 Brilliant. Any more questions? Yes. Right, give an interesting example. Uh, from uh, uh, South Africa, came across a situation. 
situation where um, the ability to apply words about where the podium is to pick the trees where Matt is is. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the question I was asked was, you know, why, 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 you know, why have you put them so close? And their perception was that the, the borehole is basically a tube going into the subsurface, and then the flow into that would be vertical. It just come from vertical straight, you know, straight up that tube. Mm -hmm. No sense of lateral, you know, lateral flow. And again, it's a not the river, and this is, you know, people using that water all the time. And so, you know, how far you go back in terms of conceptualization, but yeah, I've never yeah. seen somebody come to that, you know, sort of mm -hmm. conceptualization. Mm -hmm. It's common. <laughs> yeah. Any more? Yes. Mm. Have you actually applied it to an angle, something like an angle, in practice? Uh, we haven't, but we have a couple of projects being reviewed um, at the moment under it. So, yeah, so, so we're halfway there. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it, so it's subject to the part two A tests. So if we if we've sold with knowledge and with which you know it was a gas works, it will at least have that knowledge. Um, then we are protected. Um, obviously, if the developer goes bust and, and it gets much more complicated when you get into part two A tests. But um, yeah, but there there is always a small risk of that liability coming back to us. But we try and manage it as far as we can. But you don't have a kitty set aside. To no, you can't hold an environmental provision for something which isn't of a certain likelihood to happen. So it would, if, if there was something in the future, it would, it would essentially hit our profit line. Yes. Um, sorry, I have a question for you. Um, in your presentation, you had um, a, a question that where you've only given one option to the applicant about the sort of channel of the water mm. and the ground. And then you only talked about people's sort of uncertainty where they were like, oh, this is soil, then maybe some rock. And I was just wondering, in terms of um, how accurate that kind of question is for the swim of people's understanding, if you're only going to give them one option that can make them feel already very uncertain, yeah. do you not think that they'd automatically sort of say yes? Yeah, the, the way that you tend to design those questions is you give people a range of options to answer. So it's to what extent do you agree with the statement, this is true in all cases. Right. So um, in, in all of the questions that we asked, we asked this range of statement and it was there, they had strongly agree, <coughs> agree, neither agree nor disagree, disagree, strongly disagree and I don't know. And um, this is a common measure that's used. The most annoying answer in that is the middle, neither agree nor disagree because <laughs> Does that mean that you don't know? People don't like saying, I don't know. Even in anonymous forms, they don't like saying it. And, and, and for me, studying communications, that's quite difficult because actually, does that mean that you do agree with that statement, but you just don't want to say that you agree with it? Or do you not know, you don't want to own, why don't you want to say that you don't know? There's a lot of inherent um, kind of variation in that answer. But what you tend to do is um, with that is that you, you kind of accept that as your um, your range within the answer. So there's a section of people that will say agree, and they have a degree of strength at that. So water travels through underground <coughs> channels all of the time. Agree, strongly disagree, disagree, strongly disagree. And then the other two groups that I don't know and the neithers, they give you the kind of the group of people that either don't want to answer or can't answer. Now what's What's particularly interesting about those is that the people that don't know or can't answer are the most interesting people, really, because they're the ones where their ideas are really unformed around this subject, and you could say, well, why? Where is this coming from? Most people are able to make some kind of leap in one direction or another, even if they don't want to own up to it, but they're actually the hardest to measure. You'll see this happens quite often. There'll be a neutral answer in any kind of social survey or social study. There'll be a neutral group. And they might be the most interesting people, but they're really hard to measure why it's neutral. Because how do you measure something that's not there? It's, it's, well, it's something we're looking at. But yes, you're absolutely, there, is, there is variability, but it is covered by the neutrals and I don't knows. All right, thank you. We've got time for one more question. Yes. Uh, Past, the National Grid has done quite a lot of research, particularly in regards to remediation techniques. Are they continuing any of that at all? 
Um, we're not doing so much in terms of remediation techniques at the moment. We are we're doing the vapor research at the moment, um, and we do we do have a kitty year on year. So the answer is yes. If there's something which is worth doing, we will definitely consider it. And is that research published? Uh, the vapor research has just been published. I'm afraid I forget what journal that is in. Um, but yeah, we do generally try and publish because having having something peer peer reviewed out there is <coughs> is important to us in terms of um, changing our sort of risk profile. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Thank you very much. Here's the Matthew. Um, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, which is Harriet Wood. She's here to discuss GIS and its efficiency with geo-environmental reporting. Hi, thank you, Harriet. Hi, right, so uh, just as a quick introduction, I'm Harriet Wood, like it says. Um, I'm a geo-environmental scientist at Jacobs, and I've been there for about two years now. Um, so, just a quick run through of what we're going to go through today. First of all, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the room that have used GIS before, um, and there's probably a few that haven't really used it at all. So, uh, we're just going to do a quick, very basic overview of what GIS <coughs> actually is, um, and then run through three case studies of how we've used it with our work, and sort of how it's helped us along. So, at a sort of very basic level of definition. Um, it's a way of creating, managing, and manipulating, analyzing, and visualizing spatial data. And even more simply than that, it's kind of a way of telling what is going on where. Um, so just sort of now, one of the main differences, a lot of us use CAD as well uh, with our designs. Um, and there are sort of crossovers, but CAD is primarily sort of a drawing package, so it's line shapes, whereas on GIS, um, there's data attached to those lines of shape. So bottom level is that you can interrogate that data to find out more information. And also, a slight disclaimer before I get going, I'm not actually a GIS expert at all. I did like a taste module at uni like many people my level have, and then the rest is just sort of trial error having a go, looking on YouTube for the tutorials, that type of thing. <laughs> so the next sort of three sets of kind of the output of all that experimentation. So our first project uh, is quite a scenic one. Um, so it's the United Utilities project where they're wanting to build over 100 kilometres of new water pipeline through the Lake District National Park and West Cumbria to link up Thirlmere Reservoir like this very bottom corner, up to the wider network um, as part of their sort of future resilience scheme. So quite big. And our task was to write the soils and geology chapter of the environmental statement. And, you know, it's the Lake District. There's quite a lot of geology there. Um, so here is an overview of the sort of ground investigation data we had. So we had... <laughs> 20 different ground investigations over a 10-year period, which was 740 holes and over 3,500 pages of factual reports, which when you have to read all of them to write your report, and then they change the design, read them all again, it's quite a lot. So we were also finding that because there were lots of different GIs from different companies in different areas over different times, some of them crossed over, some of them had gaps in, and it's quite hard to tell how they actually related to the design and also relate to each other. So after sort of trying to go through the PDF reports, we realised it was probably a poor way of going about it, so we had to think of a different way. So our answer was using GIS. Um, so what we did was we had about half of the boreholes in AGS format, so, if they were all in AGS format, it would have been wonderful. We could just use whole base. Um, but we had to just extract the coordinates from whole base and the rest of them just typed into an Excel spreadsheet, um, which was quite a boring morning, but it was worth it in the end. So, we ended up with a data table. So, you just type it into Excel, pop your coordinates in, and then you can just import it straight into ArcMap. So, we use ArcMap. You does also work on different GIS programs. So you import the Excel and then display the coordinates as points 
and then save it as a shape file so you can sort of interrogate the data. And then the additional step that we used was to add a hyperlink in so you could just copy and paste the file path of where the factual report was. You could even direct it to a specific page of that sort of uh, factual report. So it's a little bit of setting up, and then it means that when you click on one of the boreholes, so we've got one down the bottom selected, you can find the information of where it is, what GI it came from. And if you click on the hyperlink, it can take you exactly to where that information is, which saves a lot of scrolling through, searching folders, that type of thing. And as I mentioned to someone earlier, we did actually also have incidents where the PDF file had com corrupted, so actually, if you sort of save it all in one place, then easy referencing. Um, so, we, I was working on this project for about two years, so I hate to imagine how much time I did actually save me just from going through it. So, the second project we've got, oh, I forgot to mention earlier, you can also do different file formats. So, if you've got site photos, sort of monitoring data, that kind of thing, a web page related to that site, you can also link it in and you can put multiple hyperlinks on so you can sort of have all that data related to that point in one place, which when you've got a massive project like that, it's going on for a while, it's really helpful. So the second example is uh, how we've used GIS to explore the spatial relationship between features. So the project is a Highways England project, so it's 24 kilometres of dual carriageway over two sections and five more junction upgrades off the top of the map uh, over a six kilometre stretch. So what our task was to, was to do the land quality input to the preliminary sources study report, which is a very unwieldy way of saying desk study in highway speak. Um, so this is sort of the overview of the site, very nice part of the world if you ever find your way up there. Um, so, GIS has got quite a bit of compatibility with CAD. Um, so, we were able to import the centre lines of the three different route options directly in and also mark them up with uh, the chainages. So, it also meant you could <coughs> quite easily compare the routes and also pick specific reference points. And instead of buying our data in sort of the traditional PDF reports and just buying sort of a square for each section. We just bought it all in digital data. So you could just directly import that in. And then it just means you can easily query it by just clicking on whatever you want. And then it pops up with what it is rather than having to refer back to sort of keys and legends and data tables, that type of thing. So again, saving quite a lot of time. And uh, we also bought our historical map in a digital format. Um, so having it actually overlaid on the current mapping is really helpful when reference points, sort of like the road and rivers, that type of thing, have moved over time. Um, rather than having to refer back to a paper map, back to your design, back to a geological map, that type of thing. It's all in one place. So here's just a quick run through of a couple of the maps that we've got. So you can see how it's changed, how they rerouted the road slightly. And Again, with the CAD, you can also add in the more detailed drawings. So we've got the earthworks drawing for the scheme here. Um, so you can tell areas of cut and fill, which is sort of quite important to us. Um, and also, as well as sort of the EnviroCheck, Landmark, Groundshore data, whichever one you go with, you can also add in your own data that you found. So, for example, we had the data about where the foot and mouth pits were, which is fairly essential when you're putting ponds on top of it. Um, and uh, we gave each feature a unique reference code, so it's quite easy to refer to. So, for example, that pond at the top, P15, you can just refer to P15, look at it on the map, rather than saying sort of the pond about 20 metres to the east of 2,300 or whatever that changes at the top. So means when someone else is actually referring back to your report, they can just tell where it is rather than having to read the whole sentence. So this is an example of one of the final figures we produced. So sort of again with the conceptual site model, it's got the whole scheme on, 
you can look sort of over the whole scheme, see where the areas of concern are. They're all coded up, so they link back to the report. And then if you need more detail, it tells you what part of the report you need to go to. So you don't have to waste time scrolling through that report to try and find the information you need. So at the same time I was doing this, uh, a colleague in my office was doing a similar project, about half the length, but because GIS data is slightly more expensive, the client was very reluctant to pay for it, so he just bought PDF reports. So this is the paper that he was using for his report. This is my report. <laughs> One page. Um, so we did a little bit, of, it was quite a good way of comparing the two different approaches. Did a bit of number crunching. So per kilometre, the GIS data was 35% more expensive um, than PDF. But again, per kilometre, it only took 50% of the time to write the report after analysing all the data. So although you paid more for the data, you saved the final cost in the time that it took, which is always good. So the third case study is just a way of how you can also visualise your data. So it's visualising over a spatial, um, spatial area and also over a time period. So this is one of our very long-running monitoring sites. So it's the Ash Lagoon sort of power station which is glamorous. Um, so I started on the project two years ago, but we've got all the data dating back to 2006. So it's quite, it's all in a big unwieldy spreadsheet. Um, so it's fine if you're just inputting that month's data, that's fine. But if you need to look back and see how things have changed over time, it's just lists of tables for all the different determinants over all the time. So it's quite hard to see how the contaminants vary over the site, whether if one increases, you get an increase in a different type of contaminant. Um, so again, using Excel, we just sort of popped all that data in quite a simple table. So it was just the monitoring date, the borehole ID, and the recorder concentration, <coughs> imported it straight and plotted it. And then um, we activated it so you could sort of set it running by time so you could flick through. So hopefully this will work. So the colour coded, so it's linked in with um, the environmental permit for the site. So if the dots go orange, it means they've exceeded one of the environmental quality standards. If they go red, it means they've exceeded a permit. And that sort of means we need to report that book back up to the people at the site. So as you will see, the dots grow larger and smaller with the different or concentrations. And you can see the distribution across the site. So you've got the surface water and that relationship with the lagoons and the higher concentrations. And um, so Major benefits, so like I said earlier, a lot of time was saved. You do have that sort of setup process where it takes, you've got to have a bit of a system setting up that data, inputting it, gathering it all. But then once that's set up, it saves you a lot of time sort of in the long run. Easy to edit and review. So again, on these long-term projects, if the design <coughs> changes, if you get additional information from a different GI, just add it all back in. And then it's also quite easy for sort of our colleagues reviewing our reports that if they can have all that data in the same place, they so don't have to hand them like a stack of PDFs of where you've got this data from. Number three, figure creation. So we showed that example of the figure. And for the sort of uh, Ash Lagoon project, we got really good feedback from our client with that one because these sort of people running the site aren't technical in land quality in any way. So if they know that green is good and red is bad, and you can kind of see where on the site that is, they just need to look at that one figure and sort of know if they need to do anything or if they're okay, uh, which is quite handy. And then if you need to find out more information, you know where to get it. And then as uh, we did discuss in the workshop earlier, GIS is compliant with BIM, which is what sort of we'll have to work 
along with further down the line. Um, so you can sort of send that data further on. Once you've finished with it in your individual project, that data is recorded, and then further year, a few years down the line, if someone needs to sort of know where sort of areas of concern are, you can sort of look back at it. Um, so overall, these case studies, it's just sort of a quick fly through of ways we've actually sort of used it in a practical application. If anyone is sort of very GIA, uh, GI, GIS sort of very good at it, there's so many things you can do with it, but these are all really simple techniques. Um, it's just examples of how we've used them to sort of enhance our working um, and how the digital approach has allowed us to sort of characterise our sites better, but sort of more importantly also <coughs> communicate the risks both to people within our team that we're speaking to, people in different disciplines within our company, and also to our clients and colleagues. So that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harriet. I very much like the uh, photo showing, you know, all the PDF versus GIS. I'm sure your desk is tidier than your colleagues. No. No, damn. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next up is Mike Glimmer. He's from the Geotechnical and Environmental Associates Limited. He's going to give an interesting talk about the complexities in a conceptual site model and give a case study about an analog model. All right, thank you, Mike. Oh, well, thanks. Right, I'm just going to um, run through a case study um, of a site where we had a certain amount of uncertainty in the ground. So we used a very simple analogue model um, to look at the groundwater flow and design the remedial scheme. Um, but if we start off, <coughs> just have a word about conceptual models. Um, by and large, you see conceptual models, something like that, where it's all nice and simple. But realistically, the ground isn't simple. Um, it's not homogeneous, it's not isotropic. Um, you have natural soils that fine upwards, um, you have cyclic deposits, and then you've got man-made influences putting barriers in the way of flow or preferential pathways. And with that sort of thing in the ground, no matter how much investigation you do, you're probably never going to know it all, and therefore any model or any um, conceptual site model will always be a simplification. Um, <coughs> So we have to deal with uncertainty. Um, and the problem isn't the things we know about, it's the things we don't know about. Or as Donald Rumsfeld put it, the unknown unknowns. <coughs> so if we're looking at modelling, um, if you go to the trouble of using a very complicated model and you've still got uncertainty in the ground, you're not going to get any further than if you use a really simple model. Um, and there's a definite role for doing simple scoping models where you don't know, so you can just see if you've got the information you need. Um, where you've got a lot of uncertainty, you can just see with a simple model whether you're in the right region or not. Um, and if you can't calibrate a simple model, then there's no point in going for a complex <laughs> one because you're never going to calibrate that. And the other thing is we design um, <coughs> remedial schemes very conservatively. And if you're going to use a conservative design, you may find you can get just as good a design from a very simple model as you could from a more complex one at a fraction of the cost. So the site I'm going to talk to you about is in Runcorn. Um, it's oh, up on the Bridgewater Canal, um, and it was a soap works, soap and alkali works in the early 1800s. Um, the reason it was there is because the raw materials for it came from North Wales, from the Pennine coalfields from Lancashire and the salt coming up from Cheshire. And it was on the Mersey so we could get the product out. There are <coughs> similar works to this one all the way along the Mersey, round Runcorn and Widnes. The site operated till mid, um, early, uh, what's that, <coughs> 1920s, um, when it closed because the process was so inefficient and more efficient processes arrived by then. However, during that time, they produced, they produced a large heap of waste product. Um, and to give you some idea of the scale of it, it was spread over the whole of this area, probably out to around here. 
And on our site, it's about three to four metres deep. It's a vast amount of material they produced as waste. Um, the site then stayed um, empty for about 20 years before being redeveloped as a bus depot. But after about 30 years, they had so many settlement problems with services and with the roadways that they moved to a better site. Since that date, it stayed vacant. Um, various, there was a lot of, uh, at least four or five different phases of investigation with a view to development, and each one fell through because of the cost of trying to deal with this waste on site. <coughs> so what we have in our simple conceptual model, um, a surface layer, oh, get right done, surface layer of a little bit of topsoil and some oxidised material, and then the bulk of this fill, which is called Galagoo. Um, then a layer of black ash that's sitting on top of the natural glacial, glacial till, and then the sandstone. The groundwater, we've got perch groundwater running across the top of the black ash, going towards the Bridgewater Canal and onto the Mersey. And then we've got some buried fuel tanks that are leaking from the um, bus depot. And we've also got a gas main up there, which we'll come to later. So the process that generated this Galagoo um, is the LeBlanc process, which was designed to produce washing soda. Um, it was it's marvellous bucket chemistry, and if anyone's interested, <coughs> I can go through it with you. But um, essentially, they burnt iron pyrite, um, or pyritic mudstone, to produce sulfuric acid, and boiled that up with salt. Um, threw the hydrogen chloride gas into the air, and got rid of that. And then um, put in coal and limestone um, to produce the washing soda that they wanted. The only problem is for every tonne of product, they produced between two and four tonnes of waste, which was largely the where is it, there we are, calcium sulphate, along with the ash from burning the mudstone um, and all the other furnaces. But the pyritic mudstone is full of arsenic, so we end up with a lot of arsenic in this waste. And then the calcium sulphide um, reacts with water to produce lime and hydrogen sulphide. All this lot gets lumped into the ground as what they call galagoo, which is a nasty, horrible stuff. And that's what it looks like. So we have a surface layer, quite thin, that's oxidised. And at the top there is actually a lot of elemental sulphur. And then as we go down, so that's one metre, that's one to two, two to three. As we go down, it gets progressively more and more reduced and softer and horrible. And the base just down here, I'm not sure how clear that is, is the layer of black ash and burnt mudstone. Um, so geotechnically, it causes us significant problems because some of it is the consistency of toothpaste, which isn't ideal to build on. And equally, up near the top, where we're getting this... Um, um, a lot of sulphates up there um, that have oxidised. It's reacting with the lime, and we're getting gypsum formation, so we're getting crystal growth. So in some areas of the site, it's heaving. Other areas will settle. Contamination-wise, it's strongly alkaline, about pH 12, 14. Um, <coughs> it's got a lot of arsenic in it, around about, around about um, 1,500 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, quite a bit of lead, about 6,000. Um, Sulfate's right up there um, in terms of um, concrete. It's about class four or five or more. Um, and there's a good bit of PAH from the, from the ash. So it's fairly horrible. And then we've got the groundwater flowing through the basal zone with the black ashes, um, and that's picking up a lot of the contaminants. And especially the arsenic, because it's so alkaline, it's been mobilised. And then we've got the buried tanks leaking, also putting TPH in the groundwater. And then just to make it slightly more fun, we've got a high-pressure gas main with a massive easement across it, which meant if you were looking at piling on, the so piling on the site, you could probably only pile within about five metres of the canal. The rest of the site was within the easement. <coughs> so if we go back to our conceptual model, um, the solution that they came up with was take the underground tanks out. We would like to have taken this layer of TPH out here. However, all the Galagoo is a hazardous waste, so getting to it was just too expensive. Then geotechnically, trying to deal with the Galagoo, 
you could cement stabilise the whole lot, but that would have made the site uneconomical. You couldn't pile it because of the gas main sitting over there. So what we went for was a soil mixing solution to put in columns of cement stabilised material and then a mattress over the top. So we could transfer the loads down onto the glacial till and at the same time reduce the groundwater flow across the site, cut out the infiltration, which dealt with most of the problems, apart from our hydrocarbons over here. So to deal with that, we put in um, a treatment curtain using Regenesis plume stop, which is a finely milled activated carbon that essentially just increases the TOC in the ground, retards the flow of the hydrocarbons. Um, so what's coming out down here has been dramatically slowed down and the emissions coming out have a chance to oxidise and be destroyed. <coughs> so the actual method was a great big mixing machine that <coughs> chews up the soil, blends it into a liquid with cement <coughs> and that, those teeth drop themselves down into the ground and then come back up to leave a panel of soil mix um, cement. And then a surface mattress with a mixing bucket and then the injection of plume stock. So here's the site in cross section. We've got groundwater flow coming across here towards the, towards the canal. The leaking tank's here and a plume of TPH going across. <coughs> and then every one of these little little rectangles, is one of these cement stabilised columns. So we knew what the groundwater was doing before, but afterwards we had to try and work out where the groundwater flow was going to go. And we have a line of continuous columns either side of the gas main here and either side of the highway drain. And then along this edge, we've got a line of near continuous columns, but because the machine couldn't get into tight corners, there are gaps in there. So what we had to look at was... What's the groundwater flow around all these columns and going through these gaps? And where does the TPH end up coming out? And at what sort of hydraulic gradient? Because to put the plume stop in, we can't put it too close to the wall. If the gradient's too fast, then there isn't time, um, is enough residence time for it to grab hold of the hydrocarbons on the way past. So it has to be far enough away from the wall, but obviously as close as we can get it. Um, and also it needs to be long enough to intercept the whole of the plume. So the problem we had was if the flow of water is through a very thin layer of ash um, and if we're going to use a model, we don't really know a great deal about that aquifer. We, we've got some pumping tests that are all quite different. Um, the thickness of the aquifer changes. In parts it's confined, parts it's unconfined. Um, and the permeability changes. There's a lot of uncertainty in there and because it's all made ground, we know there's going to be preferential pathways. So rather than going down the route of looking at a complex um, digital model, we went for a very simple analog model. Um, and this uses conductive paper and uses the flow of um, electricity to model the flow of water. So the resistance of the paper is equivalent to permeability, <coughs> the voltage drop is the hydraulic head, the current is your groundwater flow, <coughs> and you have a very simple model. Here's one I prepared earlier. Um, <coughs> so we know the canal is a fixed boundary, um, a fixed head down there, and we simply move conductive blocks up and down here until we measure the voltage um, drop across. And you simply do it until all the boreholes, or the heads predicted, line up with what you've actually measured. So you calibrate it so you've got the up gradient head and the down gradient head sorted for your pre-development situation. Um, And then you just physically cut out all of those little zones of no flow, which in this case were all those, all those little columns. So we started with a very simple one, um, just cutting out where we've got the solid columns, just so we could sort of zone in and see where the main problems were and what, what part of the model we could exclude. Um, so we've got the up gradient fixed head, down gradient fixed head, and you can see one of the wires. We put a current across there and simply measure the voltage, and you can work around with the voltage and link up all the points of the same voltage. And then you zoom in and simply cut out every one of those little columns. Um, <coughs> and from that, we could then look at the hydraulic gradient 
as we came up through these little holes where we knew the, um, the groundwater flow was going and work out roughly where we would need to put the, the plume stop and also, more importantly, where we'd need to put our monitoring boreholes to validate this model um, and also to allow validation <coughs> that the plume stop was working. <coughs> so that's just the same model plotted up a bit neater. Um, so we've worked out from there the um, hydraulic gradients we've got anywhere near here is way too fast. Um, so we had to be back somewhere around here. Um, and the other thing to note was with a flow line here, where at that point groundwater was either going that way or that way, and we have a little dead zone there, which we'll come back to. <coughs> so we put the boreholes in, and we monitored them, and found that the model calibrated very nicely in the areas we weren't interested in. But in the area we were interested in, we had a mound or a ridge of groundwater around <coughs> here. Back here was fine, so the hydraulic gradient was okay, and we width of the plume was fine, so we could put the plume stop in, but we need to know a bit more what's going on here. When we put the plume stop in, we found out, because it appeared on the bank about there. And we think what we've got <coughs> is an old drain that, I say, there have been four phases of site investigation, no one had found it. Um, <coughs> and amazingly, it had got past the teeth of the grinding thing through here, those columns are in the wrong place, but somehow we'd been missed. Um, so we then had to go back to the model and essentially you just put an electrical resistor in to model that um, and played around with different resistors until we got something approaching um, the same sort of heads as we were measuring here um, and then just checked that the line of plume stop was in the right place and it was wide enough, which it was. Um, and then we went to validate it. Well, the, by and large, the groundwater heads were very good. Um, so despite the fact that the, there's a lot of unknowns in the ground, we modelled it with enough accuracy to be able to design the scheme. The plume stop worked. The um, hydrocarbons coming through that wall have dropped dramatically. Um, <coughs> and we found the predicted dead zone because we ended up with free product collecting there, which we now pulling out with some absorbent materials. Um, so in conclusion, it's a very simple model, but because of the uncertainties in the ground, a more complicated model wouldn't have done any better job, and it's a lot quicker and cheaper <coughs> to go with a simple model in a situation where you have got uncertainty, and if you're going to use a conservative um, remediation anyway. And that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Next is David Blyland, who's from the Imperial College of London. Uh, David's going to talk about hydraulic fracturing, which is going to be a bit different to previous talks and about how they might mobilise uh, organics deep in the subsurface. So I'll let you take over. Hi. So I realise five o'clock is probably not the time that we want to cover a lot of chemistry. But what I do kind of hope that I'm going to do with this talk is shift our perspective a little on what is organic co contamination because currently it's really quite narrow compared to what it ultimately can be. So, like I, like I said, I'm from Imperial College and I also work at CSIRO, which are the major monitors for the fracking that happens in Australia. So we're gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through the driving projects of why this project was designed, and then I'm gonna talk about how we, des we decided that we're gonna define what our analytical scope was. And then we're gonna go through a bit of methodology about how we actually ended up achieving this analytical scope, and then just a quick result. So firstly, I'm sure because it's geology, most people are aware of what fracking is. Fracking is basically a four-stage process. It was invented in the US about 100 years ago, like um, because of wave propagation. Um, but what happens is you drill down quite far, you drill horizontally, you put high-pressure water in, you cause some of the formations to break, and you prop it open with some sand. In general, there's two different types of fracking. There's shale fracking, which is more popular in the US because they have large shale plays. And then there's also coal bed methane fracking. Um, shale fracking happens generally a lot lower down because that's where shale plays are found. But coal bed methane, which is important to both the UK and also Australia, is generally 
a lot closer to the surface. The ones in Australia are about 200 metres below. So uh, the pollution pathways, oh, conceptual model. This is what I learned today. This is what this is called, a conceptual <laughs> model. <laughs> but it's just a generic uh, diagram of what happens, you know, common pollution pathways and things like that. This is for shale, but we can assume it's roughly the same for coal, but coal is a bit closer to the surface. So this is the extent, the extent of fracking in the US. This is actually the back in oil fields. You can see this on space. This is an image from the NASA uh, website that you can get. This is the Eagle Ford shale play, again, which is huge. And if you actually zoom in, you can see the back in oil fields is about the size of Chicago. Chicago is about the third largest city, depending on where you decide to define the city limits. So this is a huge scale process. But it's not only in, in the US, we also see it in Australia. So this is uh, the coal fields which the government and also the large energy corporations are interested in and started to frack. This is me, quite recently being a cowboy. And what I was looking at, I was in this Surat Basin, which is a coal field. And according to the big energy companies, they're currently producing about 337 picojoules of gas per year. And to put that into perspective, that's about three times the UK's total energy consumption. So this is huge, and this has happened in about two years. And as of next year, I believe, Australia is uh, projected to be the second largest gas exporter in the world, just after Russia. So what's it like in the UK? In the UK, they are, they are targeting these gas fields, and a lot, uh, a lot of these have actually got a lot of experience from the Australian companies. There's four major ones. The one that I worked with specifically was Origin. Um, but the important point here is that they are targeting them in the north, at, but our population density is far, far higher than what you see in Australia. So then what's, I mean, what's all of this about? So CSIRO approached Imperial College about three years ago to try and get a collaboration and find out what's actually in these organic waters that come out. And what they found was, and which actually I think Mike said about Donald Rumsfeld, Donald Rumsfeld had a quote that was, there are known knowns, i.e. we know there are things that we know. There are known unknowns, i.e. there are things that we know that we don't know. And the final thing is there are unknown unknowns. At the time he got a lot of ridicule, but actually it's pretty true. And in this specific circumstance, there's a lot of unknown unknowns. Um, ironically, actually, um, Donald Rumsfeld was head of Halliburton, and Halliburton was l the largest fracking company in the world. <laughs> um, so the unknown unknowns comes from the fact that CSIRO, across all of the sam sample wells that they were getting water from, they put them through all of the ISO standards, and they started to look at you know, phenols, pHs, all the things, all the BTEX things that you assume that you're going to find in the waters. <laughs> And generally, they came up bagels, which means they, that they basically found nothing. But the waters themselves are really smelly. That You would have certain wells that they would recognize that it had these key components in, but the majority of them came up zero. So that, they asked the question, so what else is in there? What are the dangers? Can we look for everything? And the answer is no. When we start to, when we start to look at analytics, in chemistry, the reason why we have legislation that looks at specific components is because we're very good at looking for needles in haystacks. But when we start to try and look at the haystacks, the haystacks are almost, or used to be, almost impossible to try and figure out what they are. And the reason is because up to 17 heavy atoms, which is all elements that isn't hydrogen, there's about 166 billion different combinations of uh, arrangements of atoms that we can have, which makes it really hard to try and start pinpoint what they are. So, to put that again into perspective, that's kind of equivalent to looking for a grain of salt on a beach, which is we're really good at, but we want to find out what the beach is as well. The EU directive currently looks for 33 substances or groups of substances, and in general, the EU is seen as one of the most environmentally friendly organisations, where we have lots of legislations about lots of different things, but still, this is nothing in comparison to what could possibly be there. So... How do we narrow it down from 166 billion to something a little bit more reasonable? Uh, the first thing that obviously makes sense is we're going to look at similar cases because we can't just throw a dart at a dartboard and expect to hit a bullseye. We've got to try and figure out roughly where we're going with this. So coal, as everyone knows, has been quite an important fuel source for a long 
time for humans. So there's actually quite a lot of research behind it. And if you, if you think what coal is, coal comes from compacted plants, which has lignin, cellulose, these sorts of things that are kind of cyclic structures. So if we start to, look, if we start to think in those terms and we start to look at uh, heteroatoms, arom uh, aromatic compounds, compact compounds with high complexity, uh, and then we also look at similar cases in Eastern Europe in the Balkans where there's been um, endemic uh, health problems to do with kidneys and organ failures and um, cancers and things like that. And this is generally attributed to low-lying or surface-lying coal deposits, right? They're close to the surface, it rains, it runs off, it gets into either the farming or into the water supply or whatever. But the crux is that you end up with uh, populations with ill um, with illnesses. So if we take that as an example, we can actually reduce down to 16 billion compounds, which seems like a big jump, right? But 16 billion is still a huge number. And this is just when we're looking at aromatic compounds. So again, we need to narrow it down a bit further. And so the next question we asked was, what are the receptors? And generally, you're not going to sue if your tree gets ill, but you are going to sue if you get ill, right? So we ask, how do compounds get from the environment, i.e. on the floor, into our bodies, and how do they affect us? So there's a concept called bioavailability. There's also bioaccessibility, but that's a different talk. And the bioavailability describes how a compound has the ability to go from the environment into our stomachs and into our bloodstreams and into our tissues or whatever and start to have effects on us. So it would be nice if there's a set of rules, and luckily there is. So the set of rules was, or that I used was called Lipinski's Rule of Five. In the, the mid-90s and the early 2000s, drugs companies decided they were going to try and figure out some rules um, to discover drugs computationally. What happens to discover drugs a lot of the times, you'll go to the Amazon rainforest, you'll get some compounds, you'll, you'll see if they do anything, and then characterize them. They wanted to see if you could automate it. So Lipinski came up with this rule that if a compound has less than five hydrogen bond donors, less than 10 hydrogen bond acceptors, a molecular weight of less than 500 Daltons, less than 10 rotatable bonds, and a log P of less than five, then it's likely it's going to be able to enter our bodies. And so that's an important concept, because then we can again narrow it down that we're not going to look at all the things that aren't going to affect humans. We're going to go to the next level. So here's a quick example. If we have naphthalene, which is a commonly uh, monitored species, if we, if we look at the derivatives of it on like common chemical databases, we've got about 6,000. We apply Lipinski's rule of five. We add an additional filter, or, or we make the filter a little bit more stringent, and we end up with a lot less results that we're going to end up looking at. So when we apply that again to the final part, which is the 16 billion compounds, we actually end up that for less than 17 heavy atoms, there's only about half a million compounds to look at, which is still kind of fast if you think about it. It's a lot more than 35, but we're getting somewhere now. So why, do we, why bother go through this hassle? I mean, what's the point of doing all, all of this like weird chemical databases? And the reason is this. So I can't remember who it was that was talking earlier, but they were talking about BTEX compounds and PAHs, and these are the things that we monitor for, but we don't regulate these. Does anybody know what any of these compounds are? I'd be surprised because I didn't know until quite recently. No? So this top one is uh, a derivative of uh, ethyl benzene. This is a derivative of toluene. This is a derivative, uh, derivative of phenanthrocene. This is a derivative of naphthalene. But what they actually are is this is the amphetamine class of drugs, which is things like speed, whatever. This is a local anesthetic. This is uh, a steroid that's used in a lot of treatment of skin problems, for example. And this bottom one is a synthetic cannabinoid. So when you start to look at it like this, you start to realize that, yeah, regulating these is good, but all of these that are similar to them have known effects on the bodies. So now this is the chemistry part. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to talk a bit about the chemistry, but if you're interested in it, you can come like, message me afterwards or whatever you want to do. So the way in which uh, we ended up looking at this was I used a UPLC eye mobility spectroscopy with data-independent MSMS accusation, which is a lot of things, but I'll show you on the next slide what it effectively means. And then if you combine this with a lot of theoretical calculations, you can start to match up the data sets, 
and you end up with some results that are very quite surprised uh, that are very surprising. So, with the ad, like in the last three or four years, what's happened is the analytical chemistry scene has moved on quite a lot, and they've actually started adding extra parts to what was before seen as like quite a normal analytical procedure. And this is here, the I-mobility cell. The I-mobility cell adds in an extra dimension of data acquisition that you can get. So what this effectively does is, and I can explain it in more detail, but it measures four different parameters as opposed to three. And measuring four means you have more data sets, which is good, but also bad. So when, when we are looking through a large data set, we need a way to filter through it. And the way we can filter through it is we can calculate a lot of the properties that we're expecting that's going to happen to the molecules on a computer, save that, and then just see if we see the same patterns again. And what we can, what we can actually start to calculate is what are the shapes of the molecules when they break down? Like, does it break apart like this? And if it does, we we'll save it. If we see these two molecules in a fragment pattern, we're going to assume it's going to be roughly similar. Uh, the other thing we can do is, which is the novel part of this whole analytical procedure, is it's called CCS. I hadn't come across it until, a few, until about two years ago. Uh, what, it, what it does is, when molecules travel through space, a gas comes in the opposite direction, and it takes a certain time to go through, kind of like the aerodynamics of a car. And you can see here that this is going to be less aerodynamic than this one because it's longer, right? When you average it out, it's just a bit larger. So it takes a bit large, longer time to get through. So we can calculate that. And the last thing is we can calculate the weights. And when we combine all of these with the data sets that we generate, we can start to find more things than we used to. So for, as an analogy, to try and get my points across, because this is, this is the way that I think about this. So when you have jigsaw puzzles, jigsaw puzzles have pieces that fall apart into predictable patterns. You know, certain pieces fit with certain pieces. Certain pieces build together to make an overall picture, right? So when you're looking, when you do a jigsaw puzzle at home, which I don't know if you do anymore, but you look for certain pieces to start with. And when you look for these certain pieces and you start to build up around that, this is the same approach that what well, I use and the research group uses in order to uh, deconvolute something so complicated. So if you have a bin bag full of lots of jigsaw puzzles that have fallen apart, if you want to deconvolute them, you want to start looking for specific patterns. And the specific patterns are the calculated ones that we have. So like I say, if anyone wants to talk about this afterwards, we can talk about it afterwards. But I don't feel that 520 is about the time for that. OK, so let's go for some results today. So I was going to share the results from the fracking wells, but we're still there's a little bit of confidentiality going on. But what I will show is I will show extracts from some of the core samples. So we got some drilling cores from the, I think it was the Surat Basin, this one. But either way, it's a core sample. And what I ended up doing was we ended up extracting it under similar conditions that you'll find in fracking. We found that there were 36,000 different compounds in the sample, and 1,316 of them fit the criteria that, we've, that we had earlier, which means that they were polyaromatic or heterocyclic, and they fulfill the uh, drug availability criteria. That's not to say that there's 1,300 different compounds that are going to hurt you, but it kind of shows that there's a, big there's a big metric difference between saying that there's 30 compounds that could hurt you to identify that 1,300 different uh, compounds that have the ability to do it. Admittedly, this is a fairly high extraction rate than what you'll find in other things, but this was during method development. So I guess the conclusions are that there is a lot of different organic pollutants, um, but when we're just looking at the tip of the iceberg, and particularly when we have at such large areas getting used up with the, poten with the potential to have such unknown unknowns and the trillions of gallons of water that go into this process, we start to, re uh, we start to think that there's probably a lot more harm that can be done that's currently. Because at the moment, a lot of these companies look squeaky clean because they come up fine on the ISO standards. <coughs> anyway.
That's it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Would both yourselves and Harriet please come up just for the question session? Don't mind grabbing a seat. So, does anyone have any questions either for Harriet, Mike, or David? I know it's the end of the day and you're probably all quite tired. <laughs> yes, at the back. Do, do the unknown unknowns justify not fracking? Uh, I think other reasons justify not fracking, from my opinion, <laughs> like not burning dinosaurs. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? Yes. It, there will be a capacity that, if it's exceeded, simply the next one long dis displace the first one. Um, but the idea is you're putting so much in the ground that you're unlikely to exceed it. Um, I can't remember the top of my head the figures, but it's something like you increase the TOC from one or two percent up to about four or five hundred percent. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, sorry about the fracking. So, how do you orientate your attention to the same sort of analysis on a sample of groundwater that is not taken from fracking? This is what my microphone is for. Yeah, so actually, we sampled, I think, about f maybe close to 400 wells in Australia. And along with the, each of the different wells that we sampled, we sampled the local creeks nearby, we took soil samples, we took uh, bore well samples, because the places which they frack in Australia are hundreds of kilometres away from the next nearest town. So the bore wells that they use are very isolated, and so we sample them as well. Um, again, there are results, but um, sorry. land to do with looking at PAHs and the mixtures and indicator compounds, so rather than getting bogged down in millions and millions of compounds, mm. um, taking a big picture and looking to see how nasty they are. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's called bioassays, right? So they, they CSIRO are a huge organisation and they're actually, from the results that we get, they're starting to do that with some bioassays. Um, I'm here now, so I'm not doing it. Plus, I don't really understand it, but I know that they are taking that forward. I'm sure it's worth looking at it from both ends and certainly yeah. Yeah. Sort of yeah. to see yeah. to see if it matches up. Yeah. 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 I'm sure there's a few PhDs from this, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't really fancy doing generic assessment criteria. Imagine. Yeah. Yes. Do you see any sort of common fingerprints to the overall sets of data? Yeah. Like cold sourced groundwater. Yeah, there's a surprising amount of um, steroids in the waters, um, which, if you think about it, when when people date stuff, that was a terrible phrase, but when people date stuff, they use certain bioassays. Steroids are quite a common bioassay bio for people to use to figure out what time period stuff came from. So, yeah, there's a surprising amount of um, steroids in waters. Steroids are natural. They're in hydrocarbons, aren't they, as natural products? Yeah, plants. So I could use them for biomarkers and all that stuff, PhDs. Yeah. 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 Yeah.